Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Um, my name is Kaushik, and I'm an office bearer of the IIT MANA Bay Area chapter. Since a lot of you might not know what that means, I'm going to take the trouble of expanding that whole acronym. So it is um, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, Alumni Association, North America. Um, so we organize a bunch of events through the year, some technical and some cultural. And um, we just decided to pick one of the hot topics of the year, which is obviously social media, social computing. And we have a fantastic lineup of panelists and a very capable moderator with us now. Um, before we get started, um, the founder of the Pan IIT group has a small announcement to make. And soon after that, I'll hand over the mic to Paige. So um, without further ado, let me just get started short announcement. Thanks, guys. Hi, folks. Uh, Monishi Sanyal from IIT Madras. But uh, to, to be correct, I'm one of the co-founders of the Pan-IIT group. The Pan-IIT is the composition of all the seven campuses of the IIT in India, which is Indian Institute of Technology. I just have a small announcement to make. Uh, our next major event, in fact, that's a Pan-IIT event, is going to be on May 16th. And it's the first ever Pan IIT Research Summit. And we are kind of holding this around the visit of our great and honorable Professor Ashok Junjunwala, who is visiting on that day. He's got uh, the Padma Shri Award and several other awards for his work on, uh, uh, on rural advancement using technology. Uh, so he's going to be visiting, and we are putting together a, a crack Pan IIT panel from all the other IITs also. And you might have seen the picture of Prith Banerjee of HP today announcing the Singapore setup. He's also going to be on our panel. He's confirmed that. And we have another, a number of others who are going to be joining. So this is going to be a morning session. And the advantage is it's on the day after TICON, which is on 14th and 15th of May. So to facilitate this for our East Coast people, we are doing it in the morning so they can leave on time. So please mark that on your calendars. It's May 16th, uh, Sunday. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks for the announcement. I guess we're ready to get started. So um, please join me in welcoming all of our panelists and Paige Finkelman right here, um, who's going to be the moderator for the evening. Thank you. Hi, guys. How's it going? Great. <laughs> As Kaushik mentioned, I'm Paige Finkelman, and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. First off, I'd like to thank everyone in the IIT MANA, which is a complex acronym, for joining us, and many thanks to Google for hosting us. As you might have heard, the, the topic for tonight's panel discussion is the social media revolution in the workplace. So really, the goal of tonight's gathering is to engage with assembled panel of experts to my right to answer questions about the adoption of social computing in the enterprise, as well as the cultural effects of said adoption and the best practices they've learned in the field. I want to specify that this discussion will focus on internal tools as opposed to external tools, um, just to clarify. Um, before our panelists introduce themselves, I wanted to take a quick poll of the audience to get a sense and a pulse on your use of social to tools, both inside and outside of the workplace. So if you wouldn't mind, bear with me and sort of do this cheesy exercise by raising your hand. And um, my question for you is, do you use, as a consumer, with your friends, a, a social network to connect with them? Um, that would include things like Facebook, LinkedIn, High Five, MySpace, Orkut. All right. I'm going to go with the Oliver Marks clearly doesn't. <laughs> he didn't raise his hand. So I'm going to say the majority of you. Far majority. <laughs> Who doesn't? If you don't leave. We're, we miss you. <laughs> We're waiting for you to join. So my second question is, um, by show of hands, how many of you leverage tools like social CRM, wikis, blogs, or social software in the workplace? Oh, more than I thought. OK, cool. And that my last question is, by show of hands, 
when you're working is email the principal form of communication you use to communicate internally with your coworkers. That's a fair number. Okay, so just wanted to get a little pulse. So generally speaking, the majority of this audience is, uses social applications in the workplace, except for a couple of guys in the back. Um, majority of you use email at work, and there are quite a few adopters of, of social tools within the workplace, which is good. So I just wanted to get a sense of what sort of caliber the audience was. Um, so we're gathered here today to delve a little more into the second, third, second and third questions, which is the usage of these tools in the enterprise. Um, you know, the, the answers to second and third questions are changing rather rapidly and have been for quite some time. More and more enterprises are acknowledging the value of collaborative technologies, and these tools liberate us from the constraints of legacy communications, like email. Social tools also provide business managers with access to the right information at the right time through a web of interconnected applications, services, and devices. Um, ultimately, collaboration encourages the collective intelligence of many to bubble up to the surface, flattening the organization, which translates to a competitive advantage um, by increasing productivity, agility, et cetera. So as technology is shifting away from a data-centric perspective to a more people-centric perspective, a, pro a profound shift in the way we work and communicate is occurring. Work groups are no longer limited by geography or time zones. I don't know if you all recall the author Thomas L. Friedman. He wrote a book quite some time ago acknowledging that the world has indeed become quite flat, at least from a collaboration perspective. So why is this important? Why should we care? For starters, it marks a significant change in the ways companies source business intelligence. It gives everyone in the organization an equal opportunity platform to be heard without needing to yell. Um, humans are inherently social, look around. We're all here in this room to engage and interact and ultimately, hopefully, learn from each other. And now that the technology has arrived to mimic the social nature inherent in people, um, adoption of social computing is on the rise, bringing with it valuable intelligence that can solve complex problems. And not only are these problems being solved, but we're learning every step of the way the best practices and the cultural impact those technologies are having on work culture. So I was looking around for a statistic to share with you about what, how big this market is. And the most accurate one I could find was um, from Read Right Web, Weed White Web, and it was <laughs> from April 2008. And it said the Enterprise 2.0, which is loosely the term used to define collaborative technologies, it's a very umbrella term, um, was to become a $4.6 billion industry by 2013. That's, that's, that's a chunk of change. Um, and there's significant vendors here in this panel that represent pretty significant organizations that are clearly have something to say. So um, with that, I will, without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with my friend and IIT alumni, Anshu. Please state your name, who you work for, and what you do for your employer. Uh, go IIT, especially <laughs> Kharagpur. Um, so my name is Anshu Sharma. Uh, I work for a company called Salesforce.com. Um, I run product management. I'm a vice president of product management for the platform group. And what I do for the company is help figure out our vision for our products, which in this context probably most a uh, relevant product is called Chatter, which is our social collaboration tool, which extends our uh, platform and CRM capabilities to make it a more, more social tool. And I think I'll have a lot of words to say about these things. Uh, the $4.6 billion number was interesting. I always wonder where the last $100 million comes from when you come up with 2013 numbers. But that's a read-write web question, not a page question. It's true. <laughs> You want to share your mic? <laughs> I am uh, Raju Vigesna. I'm the evangelist for Zoho. My responsibility is to just uh, get the word out of uh, out and uh, educate many users about Zoho. Uh, we are uh, a company based in Pleasanton, but most of the I mean, 90, more than 95 percent of the company is kind of just behind the IIT campus in in Chennai. So uh, we are, we have been around for 14 years doing private 
bootstrap profitable and uh, doing well so far uh, hello everybody i'm oliver marks uh, i'm a founding partner at the sovos group which is a, a new company um, uh, which is basically all about enterprise collaboration consulting and i'm the only person on this um, panel who's not a vendor i'm actually platform agnostic so what i do is i go into large companies and organize uh, their collaboration strategy and tactics and i actually worked inside sony playstation running their uh, collaboration environment for two years, which sort of informed me for a lot of the work I've been doing subsequently. My name is Ross Mayfield, and I'm here to fix your email problem. Um, I'm with a company that's called Social Text. Uh, we started back in 2002 as a wiki platform uh, and have evolved into a far broader platform with everything from social spreadsheets to microblogging and activity streams. Um, and in general, what we do as a group is help uh, provide the tools and some of the practices for people to change and transform their businesses. I'm uh, Matt Tucker, the CTO and co-founder from Jive Software. Um, so I guess if it's a $4.6 billion market, we'll leave maybe uh, $600 million for the rest of you guys? I don't know. Maybe. Ouch. Uh, hi, I'm Greg D'Alessandro. I work for a small startup that just uh, went public a couple years back uh, named Google. Um, and uh, I work on Google Wave as a product manager. Um, What's and your real name? <laughs> <laughs> What's your real name? My uh, superhero name is Dr. Wave. <laughs> and Greg, just for everyone's benefit, can you stand up real quick? Greg's actually got jeans with the Wave logo monogrammed onto the pockets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's that into it. <laughs> hey, you know, you got Wrangler. Sure, it's sure, guys. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Um, I wanted to say a quick word about the format. Uh, we're going to engage in the panel conversation for about an hour, and then um, we'll open it up for Q and A. There's a microphone here in the middle of the room. Um, I also wanted to mention for those of you with devices and are on Twitter, the hashtag for this event is IIT. It's pretty straightforward. So I'll be refreshing um, the search page and getting questions that way. If you're a little uh, afraid of the mic, please feel free to use social microblogging tools in the social media revolution in the workplace panel. <laughs> okay, so I have a few questions. Actually, I want to I wanna talk to Ross real quick. So Ross, you've been in the, the wiki business for quite some time. Yes, I have. There's a lot of vendors in this landscape. It can be a little overwhelming for someone because it's so saturated. How do I know which wiki is best for my problem? So I don't think it's just which wiki. Um, I think there's a lot of choice in the market, which is a really good thing. Um, the best place to try to figure out what the real difference is, is kind of where do these companies start? Um, you know, everybody, whenever you're starting, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. Every single company starts with a single product and every single product starts even with a single feature. And the DNA of what you are is very much from where you began, the early customers that you got, the problems that you tried to solve, the culture you're built in your community, you know, uh, within your company and the community around it. Um, so for us, we chose kind of the starting point of a wiki, which is the more collaborative of the applications. It's actually the most widely used behind the firewall. Uh, unlike, let's say, with public-facing social media, there's other things uh, that have grown, let's say, even beyond, let's say, Wikipedia to a degree. Um, but I think also, I mean, everybody has different starts. You started off as doing public-facing forums. You started off as kind of the daughter of all demos or, you know, as an, well, you know, Google is uh, started as a search company, right? Um, and I, I think this, this might be true. They're a startup, How, right. too, by the way. Well, they do all kinds of, right. Yeah. Really? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, no, but, but really, I think if you, if you look at it through the lens of where did they start and uh, take a look at their products, uh, the capabilities around it, uh, and what their customers have actually achieved with it, that's, you, they're very clear differences in how they've teased, in, in both the depth of what they did and then what they discovered along the path. And actually within all these vendors, every single vendor has a product within their platform that's very different. Like right now, one of the things that we offer is uh, the only microblogging solution that's integrated with a broader platform, right? Um, that broader social platform, you could say. Um, but so I, I think there's enough differences. People just have to do their homework. 
So Oliver, as the only non-vendor, I love that you're in the middle. Yeah. And I know Oliver on a personal level that you're you're pragmatic and you're quite a realist. So are we going about this the wrong way? And my question really is, should we, instead of being social for the sake of being social, instead start with the problem and try to solve it, evaluating the best tools without sort of thinking, you know, that from the C-suite down, what's our social media strategy? What's our, what's our collaborative strategy? Are we, are we going about this the wrong way is, is my question. Um, there is no one one way. I mean, the, sort of to set the stage for this year, it, it is a very crowded market. Uh, we're sort of in, an embarrassment of riches with all the different technologies out there. But the uh, the caveat to that is that most companies now are awash with with dozens of different systems. So any sizable sort of company will have social text, Jive. Somebody will be using Google legally or illegally in the company. Somebody else will be using Zoho probably, and you know Salesforce is another component. So to, to address uh, the problem, essentially what you're seeing from a, a high level is that um, you know the C-suite guys are looking down, and they're seeing all these mushrooms growing up, all these little what I call collaboration silos building up. So a worst case scenario is where you have dozens of different usernames and passwords for dozens of different systems. So while you might have 100 people in, say, a sales and marketing department working and interacting wonderfully well in, say, Jive ClearSpace or Jive um, Social Business, the people outside that don't necessarily see that. And, they, and if, if there are um, fiefdoms and political currents and undercurrents you know, running through the company, which, aren't, frankly, there almost invariably is, then um, these people will tend to actually sort of retreat into their castle and, and, and actually use the technology for the, exactly the opposite way for which it was designed. Um, and I see this all the time. Um, so I think, you know, this year, to sort of summarize, there is a tremendous amount of tremendously good technology out there. There's an awful lot of people jumping on bandwagons and doing Me Too technologies. You know, Twitter came along, and then there's dozens of Twitter variants of varying degrees of... of um, of, of use, I guess. But uh, to Paige's point, you know, you really have to put the think very clearly through what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, just as you would with anything else in life. Um, you know, pick the appropriate tool for the appropriate job. Mm. To fix a fix a problem. To fix a specific problem. Not to yeah. be social. Paige, are we allowed to just jump in and, and keep Absolutely not. You'll speak when spoken to. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead, Matt. panel ever. <laughs> What, what would you right. like to share, uh, Matt? Is this live? I don't know. Yeah, it is. Uh, excellent. Um, so one way that I'd take that question, um, and uh, this is an interesting report from Gartner that came out, I think, about two weeks ago. And uh, one of the statistics was that 70% of all IT-led social initiatives would fail. Um, what was the percentage? Sorry? 70%. Yeah, sorry. Uh, 70%. Something like that. And uh, if it's a business-led social initiative, much, much more successful. And uh, that's absolutely what we see every day. Mm -hmm. And it's really, are you approaching this from an infrastructure perspective? Is this a tool? Or are we actually trying to solve business problems? Uh, we absolutely always look for the business buyer. Uh, we know that those social initiatives are much more successful. There are IT departments that get it, that... Uh, you know, are focused on, on solving the business problems and can do it the right way. But, um, you know, in terms of what is the right way to do this, start with the business buyer, start with how do we actually leverage these tools to solve business problems and, and they're invariably much more successful rollouts. So if, so if your current buyer is a line of business buyer, do you ultimately want to be on the CIO agenda and have him earmarking dollars? Do we want collaborative technologies and enterprise 2.0 technologies to be their own bucket? Um, we like the, the CIO budgets, absolutely. Yeah, sure. um, and, and this is a market that's interesting because it is still very early. And there is no line item in most IT budgets for social software still. Uh, maybe next year. Uh, there's starting to be a shift. Uh, but it is still taking money from some existing project in order to do the spend on social. Um, and ultimately, yes, that's probably where the budget will live. Um, mm -hmm. But... You know, the way that most of these projects play out is business buyers, uh, sometimes they will pool, pool together. It's the CMO. Um, every once in a while, it's HR. Sometimes it's uh, the sales organization that wants to change the way that uh, they are working together. And they will 
pool and their their resources they will go to it they will say obviously you guys run our infrastructure and maybe it comes out of your budget but here's the problems we're actually trying to solve um so from a budget perspective probably it does ultimately come from uh, the cio office but um more successful if it's not actually being driven uh from there at least for now gotcha greg um so but i think the issue comes up that um oliver was talking about earlier um that it's not just that you know hr um or sales will will you know get together and want to do this what happens is they all want to do their own solutions they all have their own sets of problems and they want to solve their own sets of problems and the problem specifically with social media software which is a sort of all-encompassing word and i don't know exactly what we're talking about there but you know but the, the problem with social media software is that like I'm oh, sorry, social business, social business media software. Is that, is that um, no, but the, the problem is that if it starts to break down, if sales is using one set of things and HR is using another set of things, but the problem is that's the way enterprises work. Like they're, they are their own little fiefdoms. Um, so what do we do about it? Like, how do you, how do you start to make it so you can have a comprehensive, um, set up within your enterprise and people can actually get the information they need, even though the HR group is not going to talk to the sales group and wants to have a different solution. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Anshu, do back. you want to talk? Sure. Um, I love to talk. Uh, I was counting the number of minutes I can stay quiet. It was a bet with a friend, so it's past my bedtime. Um, I think two things I want to say. One is there is a way of, you know, addressing that problem. But, you know, how many people here, you know, went to school before there was Facebook? <laughs> right? And what happened was we all survived, right? <laughs> we built some friendships. We made some friends, real life friends, and it was all good. Um, in fact, Facebook, if you remember, evolved. I initially, it wouldn't let you in unless you were at a particular college, right? if I'm not wrong about that. And over a period of time, people realize that, you know what, I just don't want to talk to my students in my college. I want to actually talk to, you know, my friend who graduated last year and slowly Facebook opened up and it spread from there, right? Um, because this solved a particular problem for a particular set of users did not come to me and say, hey, you should have a social network because, you know, how can you be in school and not have a social network or be in business? So any of you who's ever used CC, BCC, received an email from an application that you didn't want to receive or had to log into an application in three different places to find out whether your paycheck has arrived or not arrived, uh, has a fundamental problem, which is it's inconvenient. And there are two parts that will help us get over the hump if there is a hump. One is there are, uh, one is, yes, it's Winston. I will tell you the hump joke later on. Uh, no, I don't think we can let this go. I think we have to talk about it now. All right. Uh, <laughs> that, I'll delegate that to you. Uh, so, so I was going to say, uh, so the way we've seen people start beginning to use our chatter product, for example, is they might start off in a sales and marketing team, or they might start out in an HR team or one particular group, and they may be following an opportunity. Hey, you know, this is a potential customer of yours. I'm talking about this customer. They're not thinking I'm doing social software. Just like kids at school were not thinking they were doing social networking because there was no such thing. They were doing homework and they had friends they wanted to ask questions on while filling up the assignments, maybe called cheating, I suppose. But uh, they were collaborating, right? And collaboration is good, apparently. So we think that people will start using these tools in the context of the application. So that's one part. And as that circle of people that you need to collaborate, not that you desire to collaborate, need to collaborate expands because once the sales guide talks to the marketing guy for the collateral, then the contract guy gets built in, then they have to talk to someone in legal. The circle expands in a natural, secure, share manner, and that's the responsibility of us vendors to make sure that's both natural as well as secure and shareable. The second aspect is, once you have that in place, you need to make sure that it's not just people talking to people, because 
half my emails are not coming from people. They're coming from systems that say, you know, our bug system yesterday analyzed 73,000 bugs and here is two bugs that fail or I'm getting an email that your expense report is three days late. I don't want that in an email because that's not the right way for the email systems, these enterprise applications. So the problem, the second problem we are trying to solve, in my opinion, is systems talking to us as human beings at not interrupting me, me going there and being able to search on a feed and say, give me all the things related to expense reporting, for example. I think if we can make these two problems solved, which is what Charter is basically designed to focus on, then I think you are solving a specific problem for a specific set of users, and there's a natural evolution. And I'm sure a lot of other tools are trying to do the same thing. So, and if so you don't do that, then you're basically lost. Is what you're saying? No, I'm not saying productivity. I'm saying the end user has a specific problem, and we need to help them solve that. And as a result of that, there will be, you know, you can call it productivity, agility. There'll be hundreds of things that happen today as a result of email that will happen faster and in a less inconvenient manner for the end user. So that's, you know, and productivity is part of it. So, so on that note, email, the dirty word in the collaboration space. Um, I did have a question for Greg, Dr. Wave. Yes. So there's probably a lot of Google people in the room outnumbered and outgunned, but I'm going to ask it. Wave has been labeled as a hosted conversation that provides business context to communication and collaboration. I just I just did your elevator pitch. All right. So Wave does not claim to replace email, but rather downsize your inbox. Are you simplifying my workflow or complicating it because there's something else I have to check in with? Well, so I, I think the um, so the core problem is that people think um, people use email because they're trying to get something done. Um, and you know, and and I think, um, as we were talking about earlier, like they, there's massive amounts of email come into people that they don't care about, that's not useful. And then when people are actually trying to get something done with it, um, they're and they refer to it as collaboration through email. Um, it's cumbersome. It's I hate to use the word linear. Um, you know, where where you're just sort of trying to go back and forth. Um, and it's not very efficient. So what we're trying to do with Wave is take another approach. Um, rather than thinking about how can we make email better, just think about like what are people actually trying to get done? Um, and what people are typically trying to get done are sort of having conversations about things and trying to come up with an end product through over the course of that conversation. And so that's that's really what Wave is designed to be, is to allow people to, to do that um, smoothly. Uh, what we have been finding is that people will, uh, as they're using email, after they've used Wave, they start to then, uh, I think the best comment we had is, is Wave made me resent email. Because once you start using it, then you realize, yeah, there, there are, are all these ways that, ways that email is breaking down. So I guess we're not trying to say that um, we're replacing email. What we're trying to say is we're giving people a way to collaborate that they used to try to do in email. If that makes sense. So, Oliver, you have some comments? Yeah, just a, a big point. I actually uh, did a white paper for Cisco, which I think they're finally going to publish later this month, um, on the future of work. And uh, one of the points I make in that is that we, you know, we basically are still on a on a very old-fashioned uh, postal and document paradigm. So, while Wave is a wonderful tool, you know, the, most of the people on the planet uh, who don't work for Google and who aren't sort of spending, you know, 14 hours a day looking at their browser and aware of all the latest Web 2.0 technologies coming out every day and so on, are still very much stuck in a practically, a, you know, a hundred-year-old way of thinking where you, you, you know, email is effectively like uh, letters coming through your letterbox, except that, that there is no, there's no regulation of it. I mean, it's just pouring in, and you're you're like Pavlov's dog reacting to it, there's and constantly. No yeah, like yeah. I mean, nothing. You know, fundamentally, the, the way people work, nothing has changed there. You know, so you you substitute the the, the big grey filing cabinets for the, uh, you know, for SharePoint or whatever it is. But you've got this fundamental problem, and uh, you know, this is true for all of the vendors on this panel. You know, and, and the, the entire industry. Um, that is the way people work still, and it's very very easy to. See. They shut you off. They didn't like what you were saying. <laughs> Down. I, I have a control button to show you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've made my point, so. Just yell. 
Mike, can you help I'm with the mic? I'm if you speak Thanks. close to the mic. Testing one, two. Don't know what happens. Yes. Mike saves the day. Mike with the mic. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the fundamental problem that we're, we're all, to be fair, all these vendors are doing wonderful things with their technologies, but, but that is the fundamental problem we're grappling with. So the sales guys for all of these companies, um, you know, basically are going in to the room and um, demonstrating all these fantastic new ways of interacting. But there is a huge training and understanding exercise, you know, and the point Antje was making in closing for this point is that, you know, even though there's an awful lot of people on Facebook, um, that is still ultimately a minority for the for the way, particularly the way we work internally. So, if if email, the legacy application, is not going anywhere soon, why don't we focus on fixing the legacy application? I'll take that. Um, Instead because that's of an easy one. Reinventing. Just like uh, email didn't make telephones go away, right? You still use phones. I don't answer my phone. Uh, I, I know I tried calling you, uh, but, you know. I blocked your calls. I know. You, all, you also blocked my email and my Facebook. I never but, call you, Ross. Uh, seriously, though, uh, I don't think the purpose for any of our tools is actually to kill email, replace email, or anything like that. At least it's not for me. And I'm not even here talking just about Salesforce's approach. I think none of us are... You know, because this is alumni crowd for me. This is fellow alumni that I'm talking to. The, I think the purpose of some of the tools that we are building here is to make, as I said, our lives easier in different ways. And if as a consequence of that, uh, you get fewer emails and you like that, good, right? Because nobody likes receiving 17 emails from their uh, collaboration system either. Uh, you know, I have a collaboration system it's consumer world that sends me an email every time I get a mess email message. I don't actually like that. So I don't think they're focused on killing email, replacing email. What we really want to do is, in an organic fashion, do for the enterprises what Facebook did for college students and consumers. And if we can do that, we'll be helping people collaborate with each other and getting their work done. I don't mind if, you know, 500 years from now, there's still an email system. I actually like email sending one-to-one -one email when I really need to talk to just one person. I think uh, as we look at it, there are, there are, it doesn't work. Okay. So there are personal communication tools like, uh, you know, email, where, to your mom. <laughs> where uh, one email communication is more intrusive than the other. Like, say, video conferencing is more intrusive than audio, which is more intrusive than say chaim or uh, which is more into than than email so each of these each of these systems have their own purpose so i would categorize all of these as personal communication tools then we have uh, public group or organization specific communication tools these include say blogs uh, discussion forums and, and micro blogging within the organization and several of these but the real value comes in when you use these individual communication tools in context with your business like when integrated with your CRM system, so when your email system talks to your CRM system, which in turn talks to your financial system, your, your uh, similarly other systems, your marketing, your content systems, collaboration systems. I think when all of these are merged together, I think it can be really powerful because they are, as Anshu said, they are contextually integrated and there is, there is greater value there. And they, each of these tools, they do have their own place in the system. So I do think we, we need to talk about uh, Wave and email in particular. Prusa, one more second. Um, so one, one interesting thing I've noticed um, in my, my network, people telling me, okay, I went and tried Wave, and now I've come back a few months later. And maybe I haven't visited it for three months, and it's kind of a ghost town. Um, and I actually... It's very consistent. Um, and I think the reason for that is there isn't email integration yet. And I'm sure you guys are working on it. But how do we get sucked you back? Do email integration? What? Whoa. That was one of my um, questions, Matt. It, that would have been a good question. Um, <laughs> you gotta be quick, it came better late, from you. Late. Um, but uh, it is critical to build bridges back to where people already are. Um, how do I often get sucked back into Facebook? It's because I get an email telling me that there's a Facebook update, and then I get sucked back in. And that's how we get work done. That's how we do have patterns. We do have scripts that we follow. Um, 
and email is one of them. And that is why it is so critical to build bridges between these systems. You use email as a tool to suck people back in. And yeah, ultimately we want to get rid of some of the worst abuses of email because it is abused all the time uh, inside of our companies. And it is good for some stuff, uh, but we should also use it as a bridge. Um, and there's other ones too. So we use Excel, we use Word, and we need to use those as bridges into social software as well. If we don't reach back into the tools that we already use every day, then ultimately it just makes it much harder to adopt something new. That's a good point. Hey, I, was, I, I, I got a comment on that. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, it's not depending on which part of the town you're in. Um, uh, the, the, the biggest issue, and it's funny that I'm on a panel about social media, is that um, we don't actually think of Wave as a social product. We think of Wave as a productivity tool. It's a place for getting things done. Um, and the, uh, the comparison we often kind of use is if someone gave you a car and you had no idea what it did, you'd be like, this is a big hunk of metal and it's kind of strange. Um, but then when you had somewhere to go, you were like, oh, well, this is actually quite useful to get me somewhere. And Wave is a similar sort of thing where we need to, if you don't have something to do in it, uh, yeah, it's not terribly useful. Um, but then what people are finding is when they do have something to do in it, um, it is very useful. And that's when they get into the point where they, they get used to doing things in, in that sort of way. And then they try to go back to email and they realize that there were all these sort of ledges that they bumped their knees on. Um, we are working on email integration, obviously. Um, but uh, there's, there's actually um, long ago in land far, far away, that land was called Sydney, Australia. Um, when we were building Wave, one of the things we did build initially was a way to, to just dump all of your email into Wave. Um, but what we ended up finding, which we thought was kind of fascinating, is everyone started interacting. And I'm talking about Google Wave as if you all know everything about it. So, you know, ask me questions if you don't know. But, um, uh, them. but essentially the problem that we, we had is that everyone then started treating their waves just like emails. People wouldn't edit each other's waves. People um, were, were, were not responding, you know, in the places they needed to be responding. They just started using it like an email client and then said, like, wow, Wave is a pretty crappy email client. And it turns out Wave is a pretty crappy email client because it's not supposed to be an email client. It's supposed to be a Wave client. Um, so it, it, it's kind of interesting that you, you I, I totally agree with you, that you have to build those bridges back. But at the same time, um, if, you, uh, if you just give everyone the easy way out, so to speak, um, you don't push yourself. You don't, you don't try something new because it's just too easy to fall back on what you're used to doing all the time. You know? So uh, let me say again, we're working on email integration. And, and someone commented from the audience that you know, Wave is really combating the, the version issue, right? You can constantly see new versions without having to... And actually, that brings me to my next point. Um, so Microsoft and IBM aren't here tonight. At least I don't think they are. There is a couple of people. Oh, hey, guys. <laughs> so <laughs> if I'm a large enterprise and I already use Microsoft Office or Lotus Notes, you know, no one ever got fired for buying Microsoft or IBM. Vendors, have at it. Are you sure? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, you know, I don't know. Like, who's going to say I got fired for doing this, right? Uh, but... You know, these are very respectable companies. They've done amazing jobs. People have built multi-year careers, decades long. Um, as someone um, um, that I may be working for these days said, uh, Lotus Notes paradigm was probably built before Mark Zuckerberg was born, right? So conceived was the words that uh, um, Mr. Benioff used. And I think there is something to it, right? These email systems and Lotus systems are amazingly powerful tools from 25, 30 years ago, and times have changed. And we want to bring V as in the collective V, and that includes possibly probably the existing vendors that are eventually going to see the light of Chatter and Wave and all these things and come along to the, the, the brighter side. But at the end of the day, that's history, right? These are tools people have been using. It's, they work in certain cases. Clearly, people are complaining about it in certain circles. For us, the focus is how do we take the folk, what Facebook did for consumers, bring it to the enterprise, 
everybody in this room understands how to use Facebook, right? There's no confusion. You don't go like, oh, I saw this link thing. What is that, right? Like, do I have to click on it, double click? Is it right click? And, you know, we've been trained not just on social software and Facebook, we've actually been trained to click things. Um, if you've ever used a ERP application that didn't have a web-based interface, some of us are old enough to have worked at companies or worked at old enough companies where they have those kind of tools from big database companies and such, you will realize that clicking is not supposed to be what as deeply ingrained in our lifestyle as it is today, right? You didn't ever click through your expense report 15 years ago because there was no such thing as clicking through stuff. So all that training that's gone into how we use the internet, forget even social software like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, is training a generation of new college graduates, existing workers, because now they have to talk to their dads on Facebook, to come into this new paradigm and they're trained. I don't need to train you how to use Charter because you're already pre-trained. So I think a lot of that stuff goes away if we think through the paradigms that customers are already used to, end users are already used to. If we try to create new paradigms completely, if I told you, you know, you have to, you know, in order to come to Google's campus, you must, you know, rent a horse cart, it'd be confusing. Or ride a bike. So I thing, rode a Google thing, bike no. earlier today. <laughs> Paige, so the thing to build on that that needs to be respected is the rate of change is a lot faster than what it was before, right? Uh, the vast majority of Americans use social media on a daily basis. Um, even with these really large companies that you speak of, not me, um, it's kind of interesting because they're still built on very old models of producing these kinds of tools, right? Uh, when you end up having, like we have a, we release a new version every two weeks, right? SharePoint releases a new version every three years, which means that it gets implemented every four or every five years, right? Facebook um, overnight, early last year, changed its entire user interface from kind of an info boxes and widgets model to a stream activity streams and feeds and status update model overnight 300 million americans expectations about what this stuff was when they came to work changed right and the point is that so we have to be set up as vendors at least to keep pace with the rate of innovation that's going to be on the web and it's always going to be faster definitively than enterprise software Meantime, you know, I think we've spoken enough about like email and classical office tools and things like that. But if you think about traditional enterprise apps, you know, they're all top down, highly structured, rigid business rules. The whole goal is automate business process to drive down cost. Right. But the point is regular employees don't spend all day executing regular uniform business process. They're handling exceptions to business process. They're handling when the design of those tools don't actually fit the reality of the environment that they're working in, right? And the opportunity, in effect, whether it's some of the interesting blends of how you, you know, we can make other enterprise apps more social, right? Or you can socialize around a business, you know, record, for example. Um, you know, what you're really solving for is kind of the other half of enterprise software that hasn't existed yet, right? Because the best thing we've got is this really wonderful tool with email that actually is so flexible and so social that we've been able to bend it around and attach things to it and use it for pretty much everything. So we have to celebrate like the creation of new modalities or at least the testing of the creation of those new modalities, uh, but also recognize, like as you said, it's really damn early in this stuff. And while a lot of the vendors in this space have been around for you know seven years or you know more or less and stuff like that, um, there's still a vast larger opportunity and we're not talking about the market size number you know that's a an actual tough nut to crack um so that's it Albert, uh, just yeah just one one is the one quick point is um you were saying ross uh, the american market but in fact the, the world is increasingly global as i'm sure everybody in this room is, is acutely aware so um a couple of years ago i was in a very stodgy meeting in uh, london where somebody a whole bunch of um, customers, CIO type customers. One of them said that if um, if you told him a year previously that he'd be dealing with partners in Costa Rica, you think you know we were absolutely nuts. But that's increasingly what's going on, and you can't argue that email is actually quite effective on that level. Um, it just has to be used, you know, responsibly. And you know, the one other component is if you do actually get a, access to a new collaboration system, you're going to get your initial username and password by email. Um, so in some ways, it's very foundational. 
Now, I'm somebody that spends a lot of time in companies actually talking about why they should adopt collaborative technologies. So I'm not being negative about this. I'm just being realistic. So, so we, we do believe that there is a failed strategy um, to products, which is let's take an existing product and add some social features. Maybe uh, it's a content management system. I won't name specific products here. Maybe it's a, a CRM product. And you add a few really simple <laughs> social features and you say, this is a social business strategy. It's just not true. Um, it's not going far enough. And what this market is becoming, it's big enough. It's interesting enough. There are new paradigms of interacting. And all the traditional vendors desperately want in on the hotness. They realize that it is interesting that what we have done in our consumer lives, it has changed, it has changed our lives. It's changed the way that we interact. And it is fundamentally changing the way that we work together. Um, but just adding a few social features to an existing product, it doesn't ultimately work. Um, what this market will become is a new set of products, uh, a, new, a new paradigm. And it's very hard to take uh, a CRM product or a content management system, add a few social features, and truly uh, get all the way to where you need to go. So you're saying they shouldn't buy you and then combine the two things? <laughs> well, I you know, so I know this this is an interesting nice. market because I know you know a lot of the smaller vendors will uh, will be looking for exits this year, uh, you know, and maybe that's the only option available to them. Um, I think uh, that's a low let's, blow. Let's let Anshi talk. Um, I think uh, you make a very good point that you can't just take uh, a Siebel CRM system, slap some social features on and magically have it become social because there is a fundamental problem. Your system has to be web-based. And if you are a web-based company, such as the one that's hosting this show, uh, you have certain advantages, which is you have the capability to reach uh, customers and users within an organization across organizational boundaries and customers across even customer boundaries based on rules, security, sharing models, and such. Um, having a set of users that passionately loves your technology, be it customer relationship management, be it the, pl the platform for building new applications. You know, we have hundreds of applications such as risk management and others and financial applications by our partners. Having customer service and support applications these applications need to be brought in to the Facebook era. And while I like the, you know, the way you portrayed that, I think uh, oh, if we can transition the users, product, if we can, yeah, I, I know it's in jest. Um, I am taking it as a joke. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so I think for a, for a company that's, you know, the, been IPO for a while, just like my other friend on the other side, that's a, you know, I used to always joke with uh, VCs, you know, search is a feature, it's not a company, right? So maybe CRM is just a feature, but maybe not. Uh, I think, you know, the, the key point here is it's not, you know, we can all take pot shots at database companies and CRM companies and search companies and all that. I think that's kind of silly. The key point is, are we delivering a solution that people will find useful in day-to-day -day, uh, business? And are there enough business applications that will come alive if you provide these social capabilities and help these people move into the Facebook era. And I think that's what we are looking to do. And I think we, we have a shot at it. And also, I think to run a business, we need some basic set of tools like, say, CRM, financial system, ERP system. These are all the basic systems that are needed to run a business. Is the social media tools at that level? I don't think so. But when you, you slap these social media and integrate them on top of the existing tools, you can be really productive. And that is what we think the social media tools add to the existing systems. And we think it is absolutely necessary that we marry these two, these systems. I think the thing we can all agree with all of our stupid jokes is there's a chance to rethink some really good core assumptions that we've had. Yeah, definitely. All right, so Matt Tucker. Hi. You're, you're finally asking me a question? Yeah. So it, it should be known that I work for a company called TechWeb, and we're a Jive customer. I'm also a Salesforce customer. <laughs> Have you ever used Google? <laughs> <laughs> I use... 
<laughs> I use... Oh, come on, don't even. I use Zoho. Um, anyway, so Matt Tucker, um, people can be resistant to change, eh? What are some general guidelines for successful implementation introduction? Because co clearly corporate mandates aren't going to work if you just slam social business software on people and say, put it, put it in there, you know, use this yeah. now. How do you get to that organic critical mass point where people start to see the tools as a help as opposed to a hindrance? And how do you, as someone who's selling them this product, how do you help cultivate that? Uh, it's a very good question. I think we'll, we'll probably all have uh, some tips and tricks to contribute to this. Um, there is a failed assumption that if you turn on social software, it will just automatically take off like wildfire. Um, there are a few organizations that have a culture um, that are open enough to the way of, of this new way of working where that does kind of happen. And you put in a uh, you put in Jive or you put in social text um, or something else, and it will just kind of take off. Uh, but more often than not, that doesn't always happen. Um, one of the, and there's a lot of strategies that you can employ. Um, you do actually need to, to think about it. Uh, you need to have a strategy for rolling it out. Uh, very often we'll see uh, people have even dedicated staff that uh, are responsible for, let's, uh, let's go and reach out to a new part of the organization and you know, teach them this is a new way of working. It's like wave. Um, they have to get it a little bit before they, they start using it um, and just spread it one pocket at a time. And then there will be eventually critical mass and it'll take over and it'll spread and there there's a new paradigm, but it's not always automatic. Uh, one of the sort of very specific tactics that we always suggest is pick something that they get done just using social software. Um, so maybe it's a, if it's a salesperson, they're going to, every time they, they go out and do a, a customer call, they'll blog about what, you know, what happened there. Uh, and then people will comment on it. There'll be some interactions and they'll discover, all right, there, there is some value to this. If I put my, my trip report uh, up in social, um, you know, there, there's a new set of interactions that will happen. Uh, and so just get very specific about there is something that I get done every day. Uh, using this tool, and that starts to shift the mindset, uh, and that can be a, a pretty key way to get adoption going. Funny it's that not you, just always automatic. Funny that you used a salesperson example and CRM kind of example. <laughs> just let me point out that. <laughs> Guys, do, do you have any more tips and tricks you'd like to share in, in this, <coughs> this issue of cultural adoption? We talk a lot about, you know, the new workforce coming into play and, and obviously they have consumer experience with the tools and then they come in and sorry IBM but there's Lotus Notes as their email client and they're like you know <laughs> what's going on um, um, so uh, one of the things that um, I've actually found from talking to a lot of people is that you, you asked a question earlier of like why would you buy something other than um, Microsoft Office or um, other or Cisco large... now sorry I or, forgot um, to mention Cisco they, the reason people are even thinking about doing these things is they think they can operate better. And so the, the, the issue is you need to understand, you know, where are you currently broken? What are these biggest pain points? Because typically what you can do is you can find something that is just horrific currently in the company. And I tell you, every company out there has something that is horrific. Um, and usually one of those horrific pain points can be helped by social software of, of some sort. Um, and so what you really need to do is find where the, that biggest pain point is and then just try to try to address it. Um, and it usually doesn't take long when you try to do that for people to start to understand the value of it. Um, and then and then I, I think Matt was absolutely right is that, you know, you need to you need to start it spreading like it's not the kind of thing where you can just mandate that everyone has to start doing this and it'll happen. It won't ever. Um, and but that's I'll, just crazy. I'll go back to my earlier point, though, which is that, uh, you know, the sales and marketing people may, may, may take off like wildfire, but because sales and marketing own this wonderful new collaboration environment, some other part of the organization will dig a trench and start the third world war because they don't want to use that collaboration system. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, all the vendors are selling something new, and it's a bit like that TV show, America's Next Top Model. Everybody conveniently forgets about America's last top model, which is like the previous generation of software that they bought, uh, which is still sitting around, possibly being used. So um, 
there's a number of issues there. And I think that was a, that was a perfect point that it's not hard in large companies to find problems that need fixing really urgently. And I'm often the pinata in meetings between different factions in the company. They all agree there's a big there's a big problem, but how they're actually going to fix it is is kind of the the really tough nut to crack. So I think there's two things from my perspective. One is end user training, right? Um, coming back to my same expense report example, if you joined a company that used a three-letter acronym company software, about even now actually, if you're running 4.7 version. Uh, you will find out that it's not intuitive to you. How do you get in from your, you know, how do you log in? You know, you have a client. How, how do I basically find my expense report? None of that is intuitive. You don't always have a link-based, web-based metaphor, uh, unless you're running something which is very latest version. What the internet has done, you know, New York Times essentially trains and Amazon trains users to use salesforce.com. Because when you know clicking on a link does something, and you are in a CRM system clicking on an opportunity, you intuitively know it's going to do something. So I think the beauty of the web metaphor, which is what Google has been actually leveraging lately, is unlike you know, your spreadsheet system of earlier era, intuitively you know how to use a web browser. And so that's one part. Same thing is now happening. So that happened about 10 years ago. The same thing happened in the last few years with Facebook, to be honest, right? They trained millions and millions of people how to use this new social collaboration software. And we don't need to go teach people that. They intuitively understand why it's useful in their personal life, what are the kind of things they do. Hey, if I want to share a piece of content, I am doing a performance review in my HR department, and we have guidelines for our managers that they need to read. I, and it's publicly or selectively shareable as long as I have security and sharing systems in place, which is where enterprise class systems come into play. It's intuitive to you. You take your document, whether it's created in Google Docs or whether it's created in, in an office-based system of your, and you upload it, and you don't have to send an email saying, in order to understand the following systems, you must go to this system. The login process is as follows. It's a seven-page template. People understand. Click. It will be readable whether it's a PDF file or whether it's a web page. So that whole training cycle that used to take months and months for people that have ever uh, implemented an ERP system 10 to 15 years ago, or even a modern ERP system from certain companies, uh, this is a huge paradigm shift. So I don't think we need to do a lot of work there. People understand how to use those systems. Just so you know, within this market, adoption has been kind of a classical problem. Uh, one way, and I think we've already spoken to part of it, but the you know there's two ways or places that you can adopt social software in the enterprise um it's either in the flow of your daily work or kind of above the flow of your daily work there's a period in time in our history where we were doing a lot of kind of above the flow of daily work let's build a wikipedia inside of the comp inside of the company and then we really discovered that when we embed it in existing processes in existing workflows which does require a little bit of training, you're developing new information architecture, you're changing habits, but it's easy because you have a real problem that you're solving, a real business goal. People understand that's why I'm changing my behavior, right? Uh, but still, the problem is that ends up siloing itself to a degree. Um, so what Michael Idenopoulos, who used to run McKinsey's knowledge management practice and runs our professional service practice does now, is what we call a T-shaped adoption. We roll out a shallow set of functionality to a very broad base of users. Ideally, it's already enterprise-wide you know, within the first couple of days. And literally what that is is we give them profiles that are about themselves, which we can populate from their directory system. We host a webinar, invite everybody in. That webinar talks about what they're doing, and in the middle of it, they use microblogging as kind of a live chat channel. So they walk away with this kind of shared experience and they're using just a little simple thing, right? It's just, what are you work, answering what are you working on in 140 characters or slightly more? And the net result of that is, what do you get? The basics of sharing dynamics across organizational silos, uh, the ability for people to update status or context in a way that's richer than your IM system, which is really just kind of the state of a communication channel. Am I busy? Am I available? Um, and more importantly, you get the ability to have a place to go when search fails, right? Which is, um, I can, if I have a question and I don't know who to ask, um, I can go and ask it openly and I get answers. Try this on Twitter. 
And the important thing is I haven't forced an a interruption on anybody, right? And that's a very, and so you do that broadly and then you follow with the base of the T very deeply in these in the flow implementations, working your way kind of department by department. And partially because the people who are broadly using it are like, oh, I kind of get from seeing the way this one department's using it deeply and the way we're using it broadly, how this could maybe be applicable to my business problem. Because as a vendor, we're not really gonna know the business problem. It, they're going to be the ones who will know it, and then we'll work with them to understand how to adapt the tool to make it fit. So that example okay. of so what are you working on? By as is, like say we have seen with Twitter, as is it, it could be useful. But when he, when we integrate that with say a project management system, that question becomes more valuable. So what are you working on? So your project members really know what exactly you're working on and you can start a conversation right there. You're not going to poke him and ask additional details unless you're interested in that. But that's a good way to start an interaction. So that's what the contextual integration of these social tools into other business tools can be really useful. Agree. Yeah. So, so no, no, Greg. Oh, but <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I, I think uh, we've had a nice little loving about social software here, but I think there's there's really this this question that a lot of people don't find social software in um, outside of the business place useful and interesting. A lot of people find, for instance, you know, people on Twitter talking about you know what they're eating for dinner uh, overwhelming. Right. And so they don't necessarily feel like they want to bring that into the workplace because their impression of social software is it's wasting time, not that it's giving you useful information and potentially saving time in other places of your life. So the question then becomes, how do you sort of, you know, go into these places where they're like, yeah, trying to bring social into my business is kind of like saying you're going to waste all my employees time. What do you do about that? Well, you actually do a very simple thing. You ask, you know, I used to do this uh, many, many years ago when we were just starting to talk about cloud computing and I had a very simple question. I would ask an audience like this. How many people here use ATMs to withdraw money and be everybody? How many people here have ever like deposited a check? It'd be about, you know, one third to two third. And how many people here have ever deposited a cash more than hundred dollars? It'd be about like 20 people. And I would say, you're my core audience in, this is the year 2003, 2004, for being able to run your core applications in the cloud. You are the next circle, and you, my friend, will come to me in five years, right? I think there is a similar pattern there, which is some people are just not ready today. So if you've been following, I don't know, Britney Spears all your life on Twitter, you're going to have an impression that, you know, all social computing is about using Twitter. I'm sure when telephone systems were introduced, when email was introduced, people had the same questions. Why would I want an you know, AOL kind of a system at work? That's going to be a complete waste of time. And I think between Wave, Chatter, Social Text, Jive, Soho, all of us, we're trying to change that mindset. So, so besides the vendors, Oliver, what do you think? Okay, yeah, I mean, just one quick point. Um, Facebook is ubiquitous, but I mean, I would question how deeply people actually use it. Um, a lot of people use Facebook to play Farmville or whatever it's called, and very few people have much understanding of groups, as we were discussing before before this session. So people are unwittingly leaving their lives open to anybody that wants to sort of wander by their page and has access to it. Same thing with Twitter. Twitter is supposedly growing exponentially, but you look at the number of uh, accounts out there that are actually being used, and it's a relatively small number. So, I mean, it is my sort of bread and butter that I preach every day, but you've got to be very clear that the word context you used earlier is perfect. I mean, any time you're deploying any of these technologies, just like any other tool or technology, you have to be very clear what your intent is and where you're actually going with it, rather than just assuming, as Matt was saying, that you're going to install this thing and there's a sort of magic unicorn button that you press and all these wonderful things will happen and people's minds will change. I mean, it's just, you know. While I respect that, kind of perspective, I would like to challenge it because it's a panel discussion after all, right? Uh, the reason I'm challenging it discussion, is... apparently. Pardon? <laughs> yes. The reason I'm challenging it is because uh, I don't find anyone here in the audience saying, you know, this CC thing in email is just terrible. And, you know, it's a terrible waste of... If, if actually you were a CIO and I came to you and said, all email had only one recipient field, right, called two, right? And you could only send email one person at a time. 
and you were using it, you were happy because one person could only send one email at a time, so there was only so, so much email going around. And I came in and said, you know what? I'm going to change this thing. Now you can CC people. And you'd be like, oh my God, what does this mean? I could be CCing 15 people at a time. There would be explosion. This thing is never going to work. Our company is going to shut down. And this fear of new features is partially actually true yeah, and but... partially actually false. But irrespective of the, the key is we have to train and treat with respect our employees that they know how to use features like following people by updating status in the context of the work environment, just as we trust them to use CC, BCC. I can send an email to all of my company, and many of you can too. There are you know, mailing lists which say all at you know, whateverCompany.com, and we don't do that. There is a reason for that. We know that's a bad idea. You could get fired, right? So, uh, so you... I think we'll learn to use these modern tools, and we'll be responsible. Aren't Otherwise, you? we'll be out of jobs. I, I hate to be rude, but I'm going to cut you off because I have one last question. And then to be respectful of time, I want to open it up to the audience because I'm sure they've been intrigued by what you have to say. Um, my final question is about the future of software, the future of applications delivered over the internet. Now, if you attach the word future to anything, everyone cringes, but bear with me. And this is kind of a scary one. And, and we're along for the ride to a certain extent in the collaboration market, in the enterprise 2.0 market. We're hoping that it's going to implode, that it will be earmarked on the CIO's budget list. But quite frankly, we don't know. So my question is, future looking, will social just become a feature? And uh, what, what will happen then? Well, in the bigger picture, yes, social becomes one of the important features within uh, your business systems. But again, we think it's going to be, uh, future is going to be about internet systems so that it's easy to connect all these individual systems. Uh, and then social is, is, is another system, another layer on top of your business systems. We think that's going to be a feature as we look at it. No, social is not a feature. <laughs> because it's, um, it's also the first word in your product social yeah. business software. So it's right? crazy to believe that we that we don't think it's just a feature. Wow. Um, no, the this is a new way of getting work done. Um, so yes, uh, maybe maybe we're in a hype cycle. Absolutely. Um, but the fact is, uh, my personal life is different. It's changed by Facebook and Twitter. I think uh, most of the people in the room would, would say that as well. Um, and there was a lot of hype two years ago two years ago about Generation Y entering the workforce. And it frankly all sounded a bit like BS two years ago. Um, is this really true? Do they really have different expectations? But uh, fast forward two years, um, they're getting a little more mature in their careers. It is different. They do have different expectations about how they work together. They have been influenced by these tools. Uh, and the momentum is building. Um, and it's not a fad. It, uh, we're not going back to uh, our old paradigms and our consumer lives. It's not going to happen uh, in our, our work lives either. Um, it doesn't. It's not going to be effective to take uh, the CRM system and add social features, or take uh, take a content management system and add social features. It will be a new market uh, and an important market, and that's why uh, you have giant vendors like IBM and Salesforce and Oracle and Microsoft doing such big investments in this space is it really is uh, a big deal. That's why we have this panel today. Um, so it's not just a feature. Uh, how it all plays out, of course, uh, hard to say. Um, but it, it's not just we, we took some existing piece of software, put a little lipstick on, uh, on that pig, and uh, called it a day. <laughs> Oliver, yeah? Yeah, so I mean, the one thing we haven't mentioned all night is uh, mobile, which is the fastest growing um, thing. You know, it's growing much more quickly than the web did. Um, that's going to be hugely, uh, that's going to be, you know, another wave of enormous change. Um, I mean, I think it's all, you know, this is a very difficult topic to uh, to talk about because for some people it is a feature and it's a, it's a adjunct to their CRM system or whatever it is. For other people, depending on what it is they're doing, it is absolutely the heart and soul and center of the business strategy of what that company is trying to do going forward. So um, very, very variable depending on industry. Um, one other thing we haven't touched on very quickly is um, the space is polarized between 
legal on one side, which tends to really protect IP and protect uh, intellectual information, very tends to be very secretive. And then at the other polarity, you have um, manufacturing companies that like to encourage the world to think that, that you can actually see deep inside their companies and communicate with product managers and um, practically know people on a first name basis, uh, you know, making a product inside a company because the company is so transparent and so on and so forth. So this is a vast, vast topic. Um, so I haven't really answered the question. No, I think that that's pretty right on given. No, Anshu. <laughs> I said Dr. Wave and you want Dr. Wave to answer the future question? Well, I just think that, you know, being the only non-vendor and impartial, impartial when it comes to platform, I think that's the most accurate answer we're going to get tonight. So I think we might conclude with that answer if it's okay with you. Thank you. So, so with that, I think we'll invite folks to come up to the mic. Um, I have one question here, on t a few questions here on Twitter that I'll be also be asking, but please feel free to step up, state your name, um, where you're from, and what your question is. Oh, hi, I'm Ram. I'm, I live in the Valley. Um, I wanted to get, we, we talked a lot about Twitter, we talked a lot about Facebook, so well and good. I think the conversation was about the enterprise today. Um, it is real that everybody's trying to figure out where the opportunity is. That's fair. I was wondering from your examples, uh, the vendors as well as Mark from a holistic perspective, are there examples that you know of, specific examples where people have adopted a new paradigm and what the use case is? If you're willing to share that, it'll be wonderful. So something, somebody was using email and uh, then something else came along, but then the integration was great, or they were using something else, they had to integrate with email, a use case. One use case was suggested, which is a salesperson uh, does a report when they finish, and that's a good example. So I was looking for examples like that. And second question is, what is the CEO or a CEO's nightmare that they're having, that they don't know where the next wave is coming and the company is not adopting it in a culture? So an example would be helpful rather than a broad generic thing which you read in Gartner and whatnot. Thanks. So um, I'll give a, a use case. And again, I, I said this before, um, I, I, I have trouble defining uh, Google Wave as social um, because I think it really is just about trying to allow people to get things done more quickly together. Um, I think the best example we have is um, uh, there's a small consulting company that we work with um, and they uh, they every month have to do a um, a report for all of the um, all of their clients. So um, and they had always done it in email. They had always written documents in Microsoft Word, um, and each person sort of summarized what was going on. And then they all emailed them to an intern, and that intern had to collate all this information together. And then once they pulled all that information together, um, they had to resend it out to everyone for approval. And it took ages. And so they they tried doing that in, in Wave, where people could actually do all of these things together. Um, rather than sort of this, again, linear process. And they, they uh, said that the most surprising thing was that they actually got it done on time, which was the first month that they've ever, ever gotten it done on time. And secondly, um, they, uh, they saved about eight hours. And I think in the end, when you're a 10-person company that does billable hours, um, saving eight hours is, is money that you're making. And so um, I think the core thing about using a lot of these types of applications is it's how are you going to get things done faster, get, th get them done better, and get them done more efficiently to, to essentially save your company money. And I think that's what people are really driving at. And so it's not about making people feel better about their company. It's about actually being able to connect people and allow them to do things more efficiently. Thanks. Can I I'll just add very quickly to that? You, you said what's keeping CIOs up at night, and ironically, it's, uh, you know, they, CIOs and security uh, personnel within IT departments have traditionally protected the security of the company very tightly and are running a very tight firewall. And what's keeping them up at night is the fact that, you know, particularly Google Apps, um, you know, we're in the Google building, so this is fair play, uh, is basically being very widely used. So the, the, the Facebook generation we've been talking about a lot um, think nothing, even on a department, departmental level, of whipping out their corporate credit card. And, you know, in 30 seconds, practically, they're up and running in a software as a service environment, uh, which is completely outside the guidance and governance of the company. But they are getting their job done very efficiently. So people turn, tend to turn a blind eye. And I know of dozens of situations where 
employees are damned if they do and damned if they don't. If they get found caught using software as a service illegally, they get fired. But if they use the technology they have currently inside the company, they'll get fired because they didn't get the job done in time. No, actually, my question was the other way around. What's keeping CEOs awake at night that they, our company is not adopting the next paradigm? It's the other way around. Oh, okay. I think people are... I uh, think there are companies like Kraft and others and Procter and Gamble who are trying to adopt these things and just wanted to get a perspective. Well, that's of, the marketing side of the house, which is a very different, um, you know, sort of ecosphere, if you like, to the one we're talking about now, which is about more about internal collaboration. Okay. Um, CEOs, I think, despite, you know, all the hoopla, are being quite conservative about this. And to your point, are looking for case histories and evidence of, of um, this being, a, you know, a substantial advantage to their company before they actually put money against it. Okay. Thank you. I'll give a really quick example, um, and I think there's maybe two categories of examples. One is, let's pick something we were doing before and just use a, a new paradigm to do it way better. Super valuable. The other one is, let's do things that we never could before, and John Deere is one of our customers. Um, they're actually relatively innovative for being a tractor company, um, and something that they, they used our software to do that they had never done before is connect engineering teams at, in different parts of the world. And it was never possible for them to have really productive email conversations because they didn't know each other. Uh, you couldn't just email all of them. Uh, and one of the things that they did was uh, shared some information about, and I think it was the height of a fender on a tractor. And I, I don't remember all the details, but they figured out that it actually saved them $2 million to be able to share that information uh, in this specific way that never would have been possible before. You couldn't do it with email. and so. Because of the new tool, they were able to do something brand new, and that ended up having a lot of value. So you're saying Toyota is a candidate customer for a lot of people? Probably. Yeah. And you had another one. I think Sorry, go maybe ahead. next question. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm going to ask a question from the Twitter stream. Uh, this was asked, can social networking replace business networking in the workplace? Will it ever be as effective as face-to-face -face relationship building? No. We can all say no. I I'd say no. Anshu, you want to say yes? My co-founder actually is just saying the time spent face-to-face -face is too valuable for work, right? Um, and especially when you have distributed teams, this is actually true. Um, half of our company is distributed, so we fly people in on a reasonably regular basis, get everybody together. And yes, we get through some work work, but a lot of it is just forming the right social relationships so they can be more productive when they have to work more remotely. Mm -hmm. You know, I work in the conference business. I didn't do a proper job of explaining myself, but I help run the Enterprise 2.0 conference, which deals with collaborative technologies. And I know these gentlemen from the event that I help manage. And, um, you know, getting together face to face will never replace. I mean, that's, I've heard it say it's a little cheesy, but it's the original sort of social networking, right? We're mapping the social graph to the web in order to break down barriers of geography and time zones. Well, like, although, although Cisco would say, you know, with telepresence technology, which is coming on in leaps and bounds, that you can actually get a few more percentage of, of that sort of reading body language and facial. Sure, sure nonverbal cues, etc. But there's something about engaging with someone and looking at their face directly. I, I don't think we'll ever be replaced. We're, we're human. We're social objects. So the, for me, it's very simple. Name one social networking technology. Uh, going by trains to meet neighbors, air pl going by planes to meet people, you know, cars, uh, telephones, email, internet, none of this ever goes away, right? The key question we are trying to answer is, in this new Facebook generation, are there more productive ways of getting more done and maybe meet more people, less people? And how do we get more done? So I don't think anything of the past is just simply going to disappear. And it's very expensive to replace some of these three-letter systems, by the way, even if you wanted to. So th there is one example, and um, I, I totally agree that it's um, that face-to-face -face is never going to be replaced. Um, but there was one example that we found that was actually kind of interesting um, in using Wave, where um, if you have a group of 12 people who are all trying to talk about a topic all at the same time, um, and they're in a room together, you can't do it very effectively. You need to sort of keep it sequential. Whereas um, there are tools that you can use now where you can have, you know, a dozen people all carrying on a conversation and have it and then have it be effective and have it carried on, um, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, like I never imagined that we would get to sort of that point 
where there are tools that are that really are better than face-to-face. -face. And I think there's a couple examples where it does work, but not I, in general. And I, I would concur in terms of like, you know, type A extrovert personalities and versus a not so extroverted, introverted person needing to yell to be heard. I can see value in, in that answer, Greg. That's true. Why don't we have the next question? Uh, my name is Teodoro Hernandez, and I actually have a question for Matt and one for Greg. So for Matt, uh, you mentioned social network, um, social software it helps to uh, solve the company's problems. But I didn't hear like a concrete example other than blogging about a cell, for example, related to CRM or cell software. What about the supply chains? What about the HCM? What about the issues of deploying the social networks to other countries? when even posting a picture, posting a name, you incur in discriminations, you have a lot of sensitive data. Uh, could you come up with an example on how this solution solves the problems and align to actually the corporate goals? Okay, I think I understand the question, except for the part about uh, posting names in different countries and that being an issue. Well, as part, part of the now? strategy of deployment internationally, uh -huh. If you sell your, um, if you sell to John Deere, if you sell to all those are multinationals. So where are the rules that apply in the United States? We are okay, but we're going to France, Germany, yeah. even posting a name. That, that is a really interesting question, and I. So maybe we can dive down on that one. And there are a million interesting examples. Just answering the other part of your question of different places that social software is getting used in product management and engineering, in sales, and often as a way to have the larger conversation inside of an organization that's never been possible before. So how do you actually connect larger groups of people? You can't really do it over email. And you can pick uh, just business problem after business problem that you can apply social software to. Um, but drilling down on that question, uh, there is there are interesting issues around international deployment. So there are different privacy laws uh, in each country around how do you share profile data. Um, in Germany, there is an issue of workers' councils. Um, and they have to go through a very rigorous process in order to decide to adopt a, a new tool um, like social. And it's hard to get through that. Um, and there are different uh, cultural norms about how people actually want to adopt this. And uh, you know, we've definitely found that people are a little bit more ready for social software in the US uh, than they are in most parts of Europe. Um, and so as you are rolling out um, social, and, and we, in particular, target large companies, and so we deal with this all the time. Um, you know, maybe it's the, the U.S. division that is driving the adoption, but what they're really trying to do, uh, Yum Brands, for example, they want to connect uh, you know, their folks in China with uh, the people in the U.S., and yeah, it's hard, um, and there are different things you need to do in each, each country, much more than just you know, make sure it's in the right language. I'll just very quickly interject that I think there's some legislation coming from the European Union pretty soon about Facebook, you know, about your personal uh, rights online. And that's going to, you know, this is a young industry, as we've all been saying. I think that will have a significant impact, impact uh, on all of this. And a real quick thing is um, when you roll out to a multinational, one of the most interesting values that you have is the ability to start creating much more of a global glossary, right, to help harmonize a lot of the language of uh, the language that people are using. Um, a weird example also is about how vastly different people use social software because of their cultures, because of their languages. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, um, you know, we all know the way that the English Wikipedia works, but let's say with the Japanese Wikipedia, what they'll do is uh, everyone will start writing first on the discussion page and they won't touch the article page. Uh, and then eventually, and they'll be collaboratively drafting and collaboratively drafting and get to a point where they'll reach consensus and then post the very first version uh, onto the article page, right? Very different from the way that an American would just slap an assertion onto the article, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so thank you very much. The other question is, um, what happened to Google Wave? I attended some of the first meetings uh, around the headquarters and it was really hard to understand what is the concept of Google Wave. And from a marketing, they said, what is the business that you're trying to solve? Um, and even I'm checking on Twitter, there's a lot of questions is, what is Google Wave? And what is, um, how come Google buzz from day one? 
you get that integration with the email, you can done some uh, discussions. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, even Kevin Ross' indignation last month, he still had a question. He didn't even know what Google Way was. Uh, um, thank you for asking that. Um, so I, I think um, one of the things to keep in mind is what we're trying to do with Google Wave is not something that's going to happen overnight. This is not, um, in trying to build a new way to communicate, this isn't something that, that ends up, you know, you put it out there in a month and suddenly everybody understands a different way to communicate. It takes a long time. We knew it would take a long time. Unfortunately, um, there, was, there was kind of a, I'll use the term buzz, um, that, uh, around Google Wave that we didn't necessarily uh, try to contribute to, but um, we didn't stop. And so what ended up happening is I think a lot of people felt like, wow, Google Wave is A, done, which it's not, um, and B, uh, it's, this, it's this new social product you have to get on immediately. And so what happened were, was a lot of people had sort of misset expectations. And so what's, what's happened is initially there were a lot of people who, who started using it and then didn't know what to do with it. And so it settled into um, people using it who, who, who have found things to do with it, who enjoy using it, and then that base of users is steadily growing. And so it's kind of, I, I have to be honest, as a product manager on Wave, I'm kind of excited that the hype is over. That, you know, that there was that sort of a lot of hype going on because a lot of it just wasn't accurate. Um, so, so in terms of why is, is Google Wave not in Gmail? Um, whereas as Google Buzz was initially, um, I know I said the term Google like nine times in the last sentence, but whatever. Um, uh, it's really good Kool Aid here. Yeah, well, <laughs> the um, buzz about the Google, Google, Google. Um, So uh, part of that was was um, we are sort of experimenting with different models of how to launch products. You know, I, I think there's there's a lot to be learned from trying things in different ways. And the way the way Buzz tried it um, was go out to everyone immediately who has a Gmail account and let them have access to it and let them use it. And that had some excellent things that happened out of it. And there were also some some questions that came out of it. Um, you know, and it's really it's been fascinating reading a, a lot of the news articles that there's kind of equal parts. Some people are like, I hate new things being thrown in your face. I like to try it when I want to try it versus people who are like, you know, show me the new stuff because I'm not going to go look for it. So I, I don't know if that's a great answer, but the answer is we're we're, we're trying different ways of, of doing some of these things to see what works. All your answers are great answers, <laughs> yeah. Dr. Wade. And, yeah. and quickly, yeah, thank, thank I, I see a few of you leaving. I just want to let you know that there is dessert and coffee in the other room. We're going to break in about 10 minutes, but if you need to stretch your legs, the, the white room? The what? Oh, there's wine, too. <laughs> okay. Enough whining room. Oh, I misspoke. <laughs> In the wine room, or there's wine in the other room, as well as coffee and dessert. So if you need to stretch your legs, go for it. Um, I also wanted to mention that, as I already did, I work on the Enterprise 2.0 conference. If you'd like to attend the event, um, I had our marketing team set up a code. It's my name, Paige, P-A-I-G-E. And if you go to the Enterprise 2.0 Boston website, you can register for a free expo pass or 15% off a conference pass. Because um, clearly you're interested in collaborative technologies, and that's what we do at, at Enterprise 2.0. It's uh, June 14th through the 17th in Boston. Um, so just FYI, I tweeted it out, so FYI. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Manav from Many Moon. We're a uh, leading social productivity application. Um, and this question is for Dr. Wave again. So there's sites, there's start page, there's buzz, and then there's wave. What is Google's enterprise strategy with social media? That's a great question. <laughs> Never heard that question that a before. Lot, but, uh... <laughs> Anshu, do you want to answer that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what well, you don't work in search or uh, Google What ads, he said last time. <laughs> Uh, so, so I think um, one of the things that is uh, that, that's a bit challenging is um, each of these products, and this is this is something that I think needs to be improved, um, is that we are building um, individual products that are sort of solving individual product problems um, in a in a sort of one might argue too highly targeted way. So, um, to to give an example. Um, you know, there is email as part of Google Apps. Um, and email, I, while I, a lot of people think Wave is supposed to replace email, it's not. Um, there are times when email is very useful. 
Um, and in fact, uh, partly because everybody, well, just about everybody in the world you'd want to talk to has email. Um, that being said, if you're trying to do something, and I think the example I gave earlier of that, um, of that consultative firm that, um, that was trying to, to pull together their, their sort of monthly report, that's hard to do in email. Um, it's hard to do in sites. Frankly, it's hard to do in docs. Um, there are a lot of these kind of process-oriented um, uh, operations that you do with small groups of people that you work with all the time that you really just need to be able to get things done quickly, iterate with quickly, and Wave does that well. Now, the, one of the things that happens, though, is that so, so we built Wave as kind of this experiment to see how well that works. It turns out it works well in that situation. Um, then the next stage is pulling, pulling that in integrated with a lot of the other products that Google has to actually make it work in a cohesive way. Because one of the things that I think so many um, companies fall down on is that they expect users to understand all of these products and all these distinctions and, and the, the sort of the difference between, you know, uh, well, and uh, um, I won't use any examples on the panel, but, but the difference between what a blog is versus um, what a wiki is. And while a lot of people understand that, there are many, many, many times more people in the world who have no idea what these things mean. And so you have a friend who says, hey, I just had a baby and I want to tell all my friends about this baby. They don't necessarily think, oh, I should create a blog because what the hell does that mean? Right. Like what they think is I want to share this information. And so then they go and they search for it and they find, you know, hundreds of different words, wikis, blogs, et cetera, et cetera, any of which could be used in these situations. The reason I went on that tangent was because I think one of the things we need to do is do a much better job of not having to have people understand what these tools are and the distinction between the tools, but rather allow people to get the things done they need to get done. And that's one of the things we are trying to accomplish with Wave is rather than you know, I'm going to, um, I need to, uh, you know, I need to talk to my sales team. So I'm going to go to this one application. You start a wave with it. And that wave can then morph and become what you need it to become. And the more it's integrated with the other applications, both at Google and, and outside Google. I mean, we are open sourcing wave and we're doing that for a reason. Um, we think it's a good technology and it's a good platform that people can build on top of um, to be able to to have these things integrate. So you're able to just get started and trying to do something rather than have to think through like what's the product I need, you know, how where am I going with this, et cetera, et cetera. So if I hear you right, you're saying that Wave is a destination that you want to go to and then everything else falls into that. When I wake up in the morning and I get my cup of coffee and I'm, you know, looking at email, instead of looking at email, do you want us to look at Wave? Um, I mean, is, is that is that what I want you the, to look at your browser. <laughs> Coming from social text. There, did, did we accomplish that? What did you look at first thing in the morning? Um, no, uh, but um, in some ways, yes. Um, is it going to be Wave, and is it going to be the interface that Wave currently has? We have no idea. But I think in the end, forcing people to go into their browser and then choose the one of 35 sites that they want to go to is not success, I think, um, in the web. And so as, a, as all of us need to get better at that. Cool. Thanks. So I think we can all beat up Greg after the panel. You could try. I'm tough. But so one more question to close it out. Um, I have a question too. Well, actually, I wanted to um, sort of challenge the panel because I'm not uh, uh, buying it uh, and I'm not uh, drinking the Kool-Aid so much. So I'd like to play devil's advocate. And um, I do understand that collaborative software is extremely important. And I do understand that uh, there are certain applications, I'll give an example, Google Calendar, you know, where I want to work with people all over the world and we're trying to plan, let's say, a trade show and meetups and we can use this, but we're going there for a purpose, not because it's like you're saying about Wave, not because we love social media, we love chatting and all this kind of stuff. And so I would say that these examples of Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, are all very specific examples that have had very specific uses. For instance, I think that Twitter has replaced, um, has, has done a wonderful job of creating two-way communication between news organizations rather than just having AP News or something go out and running headlines and then uh, journalists picking up on this and finding sources. Now it's become very popular to be a two-way communication between live TV, it's very immediate, 
and also politically, uh, reporting on Mumbai, or reporting on uh, what's happening in Iraq and being a force for social change. Those have been very successful, people who want to collaborate on stock market, very immediate things. So there's particular tasks that Twitter is good for, not necessarily a whole business. And um, Facebook, I think, is uh, really a, a community where in a, in a diverse world where uh, kids are now in um, many places around the world and have been to high school together and gone away. And for many of us, it's more of a community, a way to sort of keep, but we don't. But is that your experience or is that everybody's experience in the room? Because I would challenge that question completely and say, I don't use Twitter to track news or publish news at all. I use Twitter to talk to my customers, for example, and find out if they are enjoying the latest release of my product. There are other people in this room who are using Twitter simply to deal with their family members I, I that would are geographically. That would be a two-way communication. That yeah, very exactly. So, so is email. Public so I think, efforts. you know, yeah. to to summarize this from my perspective, I think we've all consensus on this is social software just can't be this amorphous tool for. Salesforce, for example, it's very specific. We want people within the enterprise boundaries and outside eventually in a controlled manner to be able to engage in conversations that are purpose driven and engage with your business, existing business applications so that you can actually do your work. And a friend of mine created this term called BRP, which I love. It's called barely repeatable processes. So there is a lot of ERP systems and other systems that make your repeatable processes work very well, but there are lots of things that you need to get done for which we don't have a repeatable process-based system because I'm not gonna invest uh, half a million dollars in building that system. In that case, I need to choose a communication pattern that's most appropriate. In certain cases, it's picking up the phone, but we strongly believe that there's a new paradigm, and I call it the Facebook paradigm, which we are leveraging with our charter product line to introduce a new way for businesses to get certain kinds of businesses done. And all of us have a different slightly take on that, but that's basically what we're trying to help you enable. Yeah, I think I think okay. he's, if I'm understanding you correctly, I mean, obviously there's an intention with every technology that exists that's right. and that's why it's successful. Similarly, we're in the enterprise, we're mimicking successful consumer tools to achieve ultimately a business objective. A business goal and not just be social for the sake of being social and and that sort of fluff I think the vendors represented in the panel all have a stake in the game otherwise they wouldn't be here I know Jive over 2008 I wrote down this quote or this uh, stat Matt Tucker let me know if this is true you in 2009 you were up 85% over 2008 is that right Sounds right. That's some special sauce. So, so clearly they're accomplishing some business objective. Yeah. So yeah, the next we, one of the things that I would just suggest, but I thought you were one of the best speakers, by the way. One of the things that I would, in terms of talking about testimonials and and case studies and use examples, I think that what I was hearing, just hearing from a lot of people, was a lot of a lot of oh, social media is great, collaboration is great. This is a new technology. You're going to learn to click. What I really want to hear was exactly that kind of thing. What are the examples of how you use So we have several examples and you know yeah, I could spend was, okay. hours and hours with you and as I said, you know There's also a, there's something called the 2.0 Adoption Council that Susan Skrupski runs. If you go on SlideShare and just do a quick search, you'll find a million and one um, adoption examples, case studies, etc. And actually yeah. there's a social networking event and some of these people I can guarantee you are using these kind of tools today to achieve certain business objectives. And you can come talk to us and we can each tell you. Well, I'm okay. I can imagine stories. what all those things are. I just was suggesting that it would have been, for me, a more useful conversation if you would have spoken more about examples, use studies, and testimonials, because it just sounds like, oh, it's wonderful. So, so, so that's, that's okay. You don't have to perhaps for no, the no, next no. panel. Let, let me just respond to that really quickly because <laughs> yeah. all of the vendors have glittering examples of, of why you should buy their technologies. And you know, if you invite a, a salesperson from any of the companies on this panel along, they will amaze you with how tractors were, you know, <laughs> well, know. saved two million dollars or whatever. I'm sure. I'm just saying it would have been nice at this panel. So, so potentially right. for the next IAG panel, if there's interest in doing um, a more sort of salesy adoption customer 
story. We could have half customers, half vendors. That might make Okay. What one thing that we're in Silicon Valley and we all speak geek speak here, and the reality is that you know Mixi. I don't know if you've heard of Mixi. is enormous in Japan. That's all anybody uses in Japan. High Five is enormous in in other parts of Asia. Facebook is is broadly speaking a Western European and and North American phenomenon. And Orkut is big in India and Brazil, by the way. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, you've got you've got all these different, uh, you know. One of the, one of the, I, I'll make this quick because I know we we want to wrap up. But the, we, a lot of people think that making something in their own image is going to actually scale up and work for the rest of the planet is is a is a simple way of putting this, including the vendors. You know, so that, that's a big issue right now. Yeah. Well, thanks, Oliver. So, quick round of applause for the panelists <laughs> and for yourselves for being here, and for the gentlemen that put together. Um, IIT, Google, everyone. Um, there is a, an announcement you'd like to make. Go ahead. Just wanted to thank uh, the panelists, all the panelists. It was a great discussion. Uh, thank you, Paige. Uh, you can follow our blog, uh, Enterprise 2.0. Um, on behalf of the IIT Madras Alumni Association, we just wanted to thank all of you and hope that uh, your attendance would be an entirely repeatable process. <laughs> uh, yeah, please help. Uh, I also want to like uh, thank all the volunteers, thank Google, uh, especially Mutu and Holly, um, and all the alumni who helped us uh, line up these this wonderful round of uh, this panel, and also uh, uh, a special round of applause to Karthik and Kaushik, who did a lot. To get this going.